thank you all the three of you for your excellent work and um, let's jump right into um, the discussion of like all the many challenges and exciting opportunities we have in India. And um, one thing that I really, you know, stood out to me in, in like Seema's talk and the closing remarks is like um, the diversity in the uptake of ecosystem service-based approaches or natural capital-based approaches throughout India is really huge, right? So we have like some places that are really champions and that have like a long lasting tradition of applying such reasoning. Um, but we have also these huge environmental challenges that the country faces. And often in the West, we mainly think about um, a series of like problems and like huge catastrophes and so on. But we don't really see so much of the opportunities. And I think my first question to all of all three of you would be, um, what are really the causes that lie behind this diversity that some places do so well and have like a century long history of like working with nature to provide services to people and in other places you see these like massive environmental degradation what do you think are really the enabling factors and the causes for this diversity I'll, I'll start. It's a it's a it's a difficult one because I think um, what I was trying to uh, allude to in my in my presentation was even where there is a long history, and I, I quite deliberately chose examples through my presentation from the same state, Himachal Pradesh, which has also worked very closely with Madhu in terms of sort of some of the quantification of these values. Um, but equally, when we kind of come towards the end of my presentation, you can see that even in a state which has this long history, which has got this high level policy commitment, they even have a policy on payments for ecosystem services. Um, in a practical grounded example of a small town which is getting water from a wildlife sanctuary, there's absolutely no connection. So actually the top down commitment doesn't often connect with what's happening at the bottom up. So let me broaden to respond to your question. I, I think the real challenge is that we've got pockets of really exciting good practice, but those are not scaling. And in some senses, the sort of initiatives that Seema ended with, which are about connecting and bringing actors together so that the collective voice becomes stronger is really important because what you have is really interesting examples of good practice, but I don't think they're operating in a connected enough way to make the kind of overall conversation uh, shift. So the compass hasn't shifted. I mean, I, I look forward to the manifestos of the political parties in the upcoming elections, but I would be surprised if they have any serious concern over the issues we've just been talking about on this panel today. So, you know, and that's just a reflection of the things that matter. I mean, the state of Madhya Pradesh just had its election six months ago and this was, not, this was not salient to the debate, even though it's taking huge strides in this direction. So that's the big challenge. And I think the efforts to connect the conversations so that the good practice that we're hearing from can actually reinforce each other and amplify the voice is really, I think, the, the way to take it forward. So I welcome what you're leading. Askar also mentioned the institutional challenges, right? So I think that's also one of the reasons that where uh, an individual leader is, uh, you know, interested and is good, you uh, get some success, but then the person gets transferred and it's not sustained. And the institutions are not uh, thinking holistically, not coming together. So there are all these governance barriers as well. Uh, so one approach that we uh, plan to pursue to bring together the stakeholders is what is probably well known in this room and what NATCAP has already also been working with, which is the water funds. So water funds is a mechanism, I mean, watershed interventions in India have been going on for times immemorial. What the water fund approach that TNC and NATCAP have been pursuing in many locales brings to the table is a governance structure where you bring representatives of different departments and communities upstream and downstream together. We are at a very early journey in it. It's a very sensitive environment where pe even the term payment for ecosystem services is controversial. 
So you have so many, you know, uh, it's like walking in through a landmine. You have to be careful every step of the way. And we are hoping that somehow we can make that breakthrough with the water fund to demonstrate how, uh, you know, environmental goods need to be governed uh, and how we need to work across the silos within the government and uh, outside the government. Well, I think in India, it's so happening that uh, states where there's a huge dependency of people on natural resources. And they also bear the brunt of degradation. You know, we, we always work in reactionary mode than the precautionary mode or proactive mode. So, uh, like for example, Himachal Pradesh, people had such strong dependence on natural resources that they have no other option than to conserve these resources for perpetuity or for their use in the uh, future. It happened in Uttarakhand. You might have heard about a great disaster happened because of the cloud burst a couple of years ago. And the state becomes so proactive now that it is needed a very huge study for them to just accomplish the work on doing accounting of forest resources there and also developing a sustainable environmental performance index. How well you're able to manage your resources, at the same time you're able to develop the state also. Similarly, uh, the recent experience of tsunami in coastal areas, I think Nilanjan will be discussing, he works a lot on coastal you know, uh, ecosystems. How the regions where you had very well built uh, or protected mangroves, which are very resilient ecosystems and able to absorb these shocks and able to you know, withstand the storms, uh, but able to you know, support, save themselves very well. Then the ones where you have artificial dikes conduct, you know, constructed and they all collapsed and the water gushed inside and huge you know, devastation happened as uh, a result. So I've been watching over the years, especially the states with a huge dependence are you know, doing much better. The people are well informed. Even the departments have got good information systems, good databases, and are able to do work much more intensively and able to you know, project these values quite close to you know, the real values. Then the ones which are yet to actually face you know, this kind of a brunt and then they will come forward. But it is high time that we should go into more you know, proactive mode and understand this, the importance of connect between conserving natural capital and then going for development. So I think things are changing and, and my own experience, you know. Uh, I was just mentioning in my initial uh, origin, I mean, introductory talk that when we used to go to these people, the policy makers, the finance persons, the, the technocrats used to be, you know, snubbed by these people, were just rubbed off, you know, but now they're invited to do this work. So this is a changing paradigm, changing mindset. They realize the importance of conserving natural capital, understanding the value and why it makes sense to invest in natural capital. The example of tiger conservation, which is a, it is a charismatic species, embryonic species, but when a tiger, it's not just conserving tigers, it's conserving the entire habitat of tiger. How it made huge difference in the you know, areas joining to tiger reserves and also not just it gives uh, sort of regional benefits but a lot of global benefits as well. Things are changing considerably. But yes, I, I understand, I agree with uh, the other two speakers. It has to enter into a mission mode because it is high time for India to save itself. Otherwise, you cannot imagine it is only when you visit India realize the, you know, uh, the, the, the importance of Taking this approach on a priority basis, a huge population, huge diversity, huge heterogeneity as well. So things have to be brought in together and definitely that approach will be a very, very rewarding and you know, useful approach in the future. Yeah, thank you for your reflections on that. And the important point for sure is like being like proactive about like planning, right? And not only reacting to um, degradation. And one topic that really seems to pop out there is like the massive investment into infrastructure that will happen in the very near future in India, right? In road infrastructure and water infrastructure and energy infrastructure and so on. And um, there it seems to be really important to be proactive and that you said, Zima, to support strategic planning in order to avoid damages to ecosystems that might not be reversible actually. And um, the, I mean, the interesting thing about like infrastructure is really that it can both deteriorate natural capital, right? Let's think about a road, for example, that can destroy a forest or a hydropower dam that can disconnect a river, right? But that it also benefits from natural capital. So for example, natural forests around the road might reduce the risk of like landslides or interruption of that road or the catchment of a hydropower facility might provide services such as like um, more steady base flow to that facility. So that is like really interesting link basically between infrastructure and natural capital both in like a positive and a negative sense and the um, need to, um, to to really bring like or consider these two aspects uh, together in my opinion. 
I was wondering, Sima, you said it's like, a, of course, a very difficult topic to address um, because there's just such an urgent need for, for, for development. Um, so I was wondering if you could probably reflect or if you could all a little bit reflect a little bit more on like also if you see any opportunities from this like um, infrastructure development that's going on for uptaking natural capital approaches. I think I referenced this uh, earlier as well. Um, the situation is such that uh, the NGO community is almost sidelined in India. Civil society is sidelined. And it's sidelined because I, I've been part of the community, so I'm not criticizing. I, I take the blame that we have not been solution providers to the government. So the situation is that the government doesn't want to deal with civil society at the center, at least very much so. How do you change that dynamic is uh, very important. And I think that dynamic can only be shifted by becoming solution providers. So I think there is, um, and it's a tough journey. It's a tough journey for TNC. It's going to be a tough journey for NatCap. And if we partner together, it becomes a little bit tougher because we are two foreign entities on this journey. Uh, the only way to do it is by working with uh, local actors and really um, trying to build a middle ground in India which is more solution oriented. The middle in India is, we talk about the political middle in the US, in India I talk about the civil society middle, it is non-existent. We have two extremes of uh, human rights centric NGOs and you know, wildlife centric NGOs. We need solution providers in the middle and there are a few uh, and we have to just keep them together and amplify, uh, you know, their engagement with the government and we have made a breakthrough with respect to the uh, 15th Finance Commission. Um, we've joined hands uh, with about five uh, Indian organizations uh, to provide support to the Finance Commission on that seven and a half percent formula. But this is just one, uh, you know, effort. So um, the, other, the other approach I think, which is also fraught with some dangers, but is probably uh, a more immediate approach that can be taken is to work with businesses because businesses understand the challenges much better that they themselves will face if they don't take care of the natural capital and the government is willing to talk to businesses. And so partnering with businesses, especially Indian businesses, is very important. And then I think uh, a third approach is to really uh, focus at the state level. Civil society spends far too much time talking to the government of India and the capacity at the state level is very weak. I think donors need to come together with Indian civil society and really help focus their efforts at state levels where infrastructure actually gets built and then that's the right intervention point and the state governments are much more open to taking help. I'll, I'll pick up at that last uh, concluding comment of Seema's, which is, which is about the different scales at which these interventions can happen. So I think um, I, I try to say that I also see the opportunities at the subnational scale as being potentially much more exciting. Um, even the current government talks about a spirit of, I think they use the phrase competitive federalism. They're trying to get the states to see their kind of um, achievements in, in a competitive spirit. But they've also done that at subnational scales. There's a sort of, um, there's a smart cities initiative which has been launched. I tried my best when they were trying to launch it to say smartness is not just technological smartness, which is what the focus is, but wouldn't it be good to have ecologically smart cities? And actually the sort of slogan we should all collectively be talking about is ecologically smart infrastructure. You know, I mean, if you're talking about this is not an anti-infrastructure or an anti-urbanization message, but smartness need, needs to be ecologically smart decision making. And I think we've missed a trick because the Smart Cities Initiative, I've looked at the plans submitted by all 100 cities, not one of them has taken into account any of these ecological functions. It's all about transport uh, apps, which are going to help people to have you know, smoother flows of traffic through the city. 
and it's nothing to do with the ecological smartness that we could we could take forward. So I think there are these opportunities at subnational scale, and then at district scale as well. The 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 successor to India's Planning Commission, which is called the Niti Aayog, has launched something called the 100 Aspirational Districts Program. So even in the rural sector, they're trying to get districts to compete with each other in terms of developmental indicators. And if those development indicators could reflect ecologically smart outcomes, then I think there's a real opportunity. So I do agree with that final point. I have to gently disagree on the civil society stuff because partly um, governments which are solution oriented have rejected solutions which have been put forward. So it's not that civil society actors haven't necessarily put forward solutions, but they're often solutions that are not compatible with the current developmental mindset of the, of the rural, ruling dispensation. So there is a difference. Um, we do have to recognize that it's not just about, there are alternative pathways and there is a mindset which is prevalent at the moment, which isn't necessarily willing to listen to solution-oriented alternative pathways. And that makes the conversation a bit more difficult. So I'd, I'd be a bit more cautious about suggesting that civil society has not been solution-oriented enough. There have been solutions, but they don't necessarily match with the political um, uh, leanings of, of particular governments. Uh, for the complimenting what Seema and Bhaskar have said, uh, the NGO's experience in India has been, you know, uh, I would say, uh, very challenging, very interesting at the same time. It's been so happening that different actors are working in their own worlds. They never try to, you know, uh, go beyond their own boundaries to interact and then provide very holistic solutions. But I think things are changing nowadays. We are much more open. We work in a landscape mode than in the mode of our own, you know, uh, boundaries and then, then go uh, back to each other and then try to interact. So that's what's happening in India. Things are changing, changing for good, definitely. Uh, I also, uh, uh, what Dr. Pada Chitwood Bhaiskar has said, uh, we, we talk a lot about ecological, we talk a lot about so called physical infrastructure. We never talk much about ecological infrastructure, which plays such an important role in the Indian context. I think we rightly said that the smart city is no longer, it's not a smart city. It is, I would say it's a very unsmart way of, you know, developing a smart city. You talk about all the gadgets, all the, you know, high fi high flung, you know, uh, sort of equipments and uh, apps to actually facilitate your living. At the same time, the base from where actually you derive your living is totally not taken into consideration. So I think there's a need to merge ecological infrastructure with the physical infrastructure to develop a real kind of a smart city. Thirdly, uh, the work that we have been doing, anybody, all academicians, NGOs, civil society, a lot of technical work also happens, but it doesn't translate into very simple kind of expression about how society can understand the technical work being done by all of us. So it's very, very important to also convert because you're doing work for them, but they're not aware of what work has been done, how they can also participate, contribute, and the whole process becomes much more easier. I think science should convert into a simple expression, simple information sheet, some kind of, you know, information uh, ways can be given to the larger community and they become very responsive, they can participate in the whole process and the solutions can be definitely very, very easily forthcoming. Thank you all so much. Um, there would be a million more questions I would like to ask you, but I would like also to give the audience the opportunity um, to ask some questions. And first of all, um, we have a special guest here, Nilan Jan Ghosh from WWF, who, uh, India, who is their senior economic advisor and also the director of the Observer Research Foundation. And um, given his knowledge and experience, we would like to first give him like the opportunity for a short reflection on the things we've heard so far. Is it working? Okay. First of all, I take the last point of Professor Verma. I presume that one of the biggest challenges that we are facing in WWF India uh, is with the communication element. And that too, in fact, uh, as far as the landscape coordinators are concerned. In fact, uh, we have been conducting a host of studies in the context of uh, natural capital assessment and valuation of ecosystem services ever since this entire program of ecological economics started in WWF India with me joining them as an advisor. Uh, we intervened uh, by uh, valuing ecosystem services at a landscape level. We developed an index known as the ecosystem dependency index so that it reflects on the amount of dependency that the local community essentially has on the ecosystem. It's a simple ratio, ratio in the sense, uh, the valuation of the ecosystem services 
concern, uh, concerned primarily with the provisioning and the regulating ones divided by the income of the co local community. In most cases, what we found that, uh, was that as far as the rural communities are concerned, the rural poor, they are, this ratio was turning out to be more than one. That means they are earning much more from the ecosystem services than from the incomes uh, generated through their employment in other uh, sectors. Now this essentially builds the case that ecosystem services is the GDP of the poor, which essentially TEEB actually put across. Then in fact we tried to factor in uh, ecosystem services and values in fact in uh, uh, project appraisals as well and also in the context of climate change uh, where we found that in the delta regions of the Indian Sundarbans where uh, essentially there was a large component of the vulnerable population uh, which couldn't essentially stay there because of sea level rise and global warming and eventually they needed to be moved to the uh, safer zones and uh, the recommendation was that by 2050 this should happen and the ecosystem should be allowed to regenerate. And when we essentially did the entire cost benefit analysis of the entire scheme of things with service sector employment taking place and the ecosystem services thus generated, we found that this movement essentially has 12.8 times more benefits than the business as the usual case. And finally, taking your case of uh, the flow regime, we also did a valuation on how essentially uh, various flow regimes can have eco various ecosystem services. Now the biggest problem that we found was that fine, technically we are publishing them, but how do we essentially communicate these? Well, first of all, at the very local level to our own landscape coordinators and they are the ones who are taking it across to essentially the local level policymakers and the decision makers. So this is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing. We are still now groping with that. Uh, some of these in fact are already there in fact in this booklet which I have with me, some of the uh, findings of, uh, I, I mean, the policy briefs, I, ca I can keep that uh, these in the reception and people are free to collect them from me. So thank you so much. Thank you, Nilendran. And Nilendran will also give a presentation tomorrow, I believe, where he will like outline more um, of the details. Now I would like to invite like everybody here in the audience um, to please raise your hands if you have any questions to our panelists. Let's probably take like collect one or two questions and then answer them. I'll, I'll introduce myself. Uh, Pavit Ramachandran from the Asian Development Bank. And good to see you, Seema, after so many years. Uh, no, I think I pick up on the question that, you know, I think was just being discussed in terms of uh, change on the ground, right? And, and I was quite intrigued because I, you know, happen to come from Chennai. And, uh, you know, I know some of the issues in terms of encroachment of water spread areas, uh, you know, optimizing land. So what was really, I'd like to hear, I mean, certainly from TNC's perspective, what was the trigger, the catalyst for the change finally? Um, was it competitive federalism or was it uh, some other kind of, uh, you know, agency on the ground? Because that, something changed, obviously, right? The smart city plans are now much more reflective of these considerations. So that would be quite interesting to look at what actually shifted the needle on that. And, and the other question I think I had was uh, related to, you know, ecosystem service valuation. Now, I think there's a lot of work that's been done over several years now. And I, you know, there's, it, we don't need to belabor that point anymore. People understand the importance of that. I think the challenge has been really to move that to fiscal transfers. You know, when you're trying to convince policy make makers grappling with, you know, resource constraints and how best to make the argument in terms of jobs, incomes, you know, all the fiscal arguments that need to be made. And, you know, the GDP of the poor argument takes that step uh, forward. But I think that's really the, the, the challenge, if you like, I think, really to translate what are largely imputed values. I mean, ec ecosystem service values are still, to that extent, imputed, uh, and move that to fiscal arguments. So I just two points. I'd, I'd like to hear reflections from the Chennai and I think uh, Madhu might speak to the second question. <clears throat> so it's good to meet you again, uh, Pavit. The world is round and uh, our community is very small. Um, so Chennai, as I mentioned, has become the poster child of climate change. And the only silver lining of that is a high level of awareness 
that we are suffering as citizens of Chennai because uh, we made some very big mistakes. And the peer, citizens of Chennai now understand that those mistakes have to do with the fact that they built the airport on what was uh, the uh, you know uh, area for their floodwaters. Uh, they've uh, built an IT corridor, a whole IT corridor on their uh, wetlands. Um, and so all of this has come to haunt the city. They have uh, 300 of the lakes are gone. Uh, they've become real estate. Only 150 are left. So no wonder they have challenges in terms of meeting their daily water needs. They have floods and they have droughts. So the that it's that awareness among citizens and the bureaucrats that has led to uh, the city finally recognizing that they must tackle the lakes issue as part of their smart city plan. And you're right, Bhaskar, very few cities have tried to focus on green infrastructure. When we were looking at, uh, you know, through the smart city filter where we should go and work, there were only like uh, a couple of cities that really uh, prioritized their water infrastructure. Coimbatore was one of them and uh, Chennai was another one of them. I totally agree with you that we need to take forward the evaluation aspect and converting them into some kind of payment mechanisms. Uh, we had an experiment, uh, of course, the Marshall study, which I just mentioned, which Pascal also quoted, led to conversion of value into a charge. Uh, compensation for the loss of ecological value. Further led to creation of net present value regime in the country. But, uh, but I was just watching that uh, we, we do have a value for diversion of forests, but there's no such value for conservation of forests. That's how the whole you know study for Finance Commission came into being. And the first study which we did for 13th Finance Commission was able to appreciate to some extent, give some amount of grant money to the, to the, to the country, to, to various states rather. But then it was realized and we further demonstrated through very sophisticated formula considering not just you know, the forest cover but the larger set of indicators like biodiversity richness, the contiguity of areas, the compartmentalization, all, all such things were considered. Then it, it, it felt convinced and uh, uh, it had given a huge amount of money, 0.7 billion to the jump of almost 700 billion. It was a huge jump which happened in the, in the country in terms of value which was given to the states. What is the evolution of taxes? It became, to, till date, you know, it was quoted in many platforms to be the, one of the largest PS in the world in terms of compensating states for conserving their uh, resource base. But uh, we had an experience of Himachal Pradesh in work with Bhaskar and a couple of other organizations way back in, you know, again, 2005 and 6 to set up a kind of a payment for ecosystem model on one-to-one -one basis of it is done in Brazil, Costa Rica, Ecuador, like that. But in India, uh, we realize the cost of transaction is huge. It worked very well in, in project mode. But when you leave it aside and let other communities to come together and set up these models, they don't work as such. The populations are diverse, located geographically very far off places and heterogeneous as well. So this became a much more easier way of compensating states for conserving natural resource base through the Finance Commission. And on this Finance Commission, we expanded our calculus for not just forest. We talked about this 7.5% this retention. We talked about further allocation of grant for catchment area treatment for a couple of other interventions, but also talk about this, uh, which Seema also brought it out in her study in a presentation, achievement of NDC. You know, uh, we have targets given to us from 2.5 to 3.5 billion tons of carbon. So we are trying to achieve this for another request of grant regarding you know, uh, trees outside forest. The forest area is not enough actually to address these issues, so there we can also do that. And also looking at the water quality, you know, uh, waste management and the air quality aspect. So this is how we are addressing the, uh, we're establishing the connect between value and the payment for ecosystems so through the Finance Commission, because it has a least transaction cost as compared to one-to-one -one basis kind of mechanism. Okay, thank you very much. Um, on this note, um, I would like to close this session and um, I would like to invite you all to give a very warm applause to our speakers who came from so far. <laughs> And I think we can all be very excited at the Natural Capital Project and the broader kind of conservation community towards the opportunities and challenges that need to be addressed in India. Thank you so much again. And, uh, <laughs>